everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, I appreciate it. This is going to be an unusual talk. So this is my uh, public service announcement. I've given this talk once before. It's an unusual talk because I'm not actually talking about you know, uh, you know, fixing anything. I'm not talking about databases specifically. Oh, you want to come in? Yes, we have a seat just for you. Um, see, it's just, just for you. We saved all these seats. Yes. <laughs> see, now he's committed. It's like I said, you know, see, it works. Um, so this is a bit of an unusual talk because uh, this isn't really about any one specific topic, but it's a collection of stories. And there are things that we see in the real life uh, space that really have, um, you know, some commonality with things that we do in the tech space. So for those of you who haven't heard me talk yet, I'm Matt Yakovit, Head of Open Source Strategy at Percona. So we do open source database software and services. Um, if you're interested, you can follow me on Twitter. You can check out the podcast, The Hoss. That's me, Head of Open Source Strategy Talks Foss, free and open source software. It rhymes and everything. That's cool. So that's awesome. So um, you should uh, check that out. So. I wanted to start to tell you a little story about something that happened to me this week. So I have a 20-year-old daughter who's soon to be 21. She works at a veterinary clinic. And I dropped her off last Saturday, and uh, like I normally do. And so about an hour after I drop her off, I get this text. Okay. So I don't know how many of you have kids, um, but when you get this type of text, you generally don't know how to respond initially, right? So, hey, can somebody get me? I might need to go to the urgent care. This could be something that is small. It could be something that's big. So, you, you know, naturally, you, you don't know how to respond. But when you say, I might need to go, there's some doubt there, right? So it doesn't really have the sense of urgency. So, okay, let's investigate further. Of course, we investigate a little more. What's wrong? Oh, a doc bit me pretty good. And uh, it did break the skin. Now, my daughter gets bitten probably three times a week by dogs. Generally not that bad, but she does get bit in her line of work. OK, so I'm on my way. So it doesn't sound terribly urgent, but you, know, you do have some concern. And so uh, me and the wife pile in the car. We drive the five minutes down the road, and then we pull into the vet clinic. What do you think that we saw at the vet clinic? Anybody have any guesses? Well, I'll tell you what we saw. So we saw animal control because, hey, it's a dog bite. OK, that makes sense. But what didn't make sense is the two police cars or the ambulance pulling the stretcher out of the back or the fire truck. These are all things that you don't want to see after you get that text, right? I mean, I don't know if, you, uh, you know, if you're different, but when you pull in and you get a text that you are supposed to come pick up someone and uh, you know, not that sense of urgency, but you see all that, you kind of freak out a little bit. So of course, that heart attack pain, you're like, oh my gosh, I thought it was the cheeseburger's gonna kill me, but no, it's this because it's so stressful. And so you freak out, you know, you, your level goes all the way to 99 and you're just you know, horribly upset. So you, you park sloppily, you jump out of the car, you run inside, and you talk to the uh, tech people and you say, you know, oh, is this for Carly? And they're like, wait a minute, no, 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 stop freaking out. This isn't for her, it's for the other person who got bit. So wait, oh, there's two people who got bit now. Yes, there's two people who got bit. Okay, okay. Well, yeah, so the other one's worse. So Carly comes out and she's bandaged her arm up and she's walking out with the uh, fire chief and fire chief says, well, hey, uh, She's going to need some stitches, but uh, you can take her. OK, so we get her in the car, and she explains. She's really upset. She hopes they don't do anything to the dog. She's more worried about the dog than herself. You know, so you, know, you start to calm down, and she says, you know, yeah, the dog. We, I, I love the dog. The dog's name is Chaos. It really is Chaos. You know? um, and so she loves Chaos, and she doesn't want anything bad to happen to him. So by the time we get to the hospital, you know, everybody is um, a little bit calmer. You know, OK, so dog bite wasn't maybe as bad. The other person seems to have gotten it much worse. Thank God we avoided that. And so we go into the emergency room. We go into the back, and they unbandage it. And then it's like, oh, no, it got worse. Because you start to see the things that you don't want to see sticking out. And you're like, oh, no, that's horrible. And so, of course, you pass out on the floor. And then they revive you. And then um, we find out, oh, you know what? It wasn't nearly as bad as it looked. So now we have gone back and forth. And she's gotten some stitches, got a few days off of work, 
and she's back at work. So that was my weekend last weekend before I came here. So this weekend's a little better already. But my question to all of you is, this happened to you before? Has anybody else had this happen? Well, maybe not this exact thing, but you do, right? So as we've written software, as we've designed new applications, how many people have written kind of sloppy error messages or alerts in their pipelines or have put out things that really don't, you know, put off the sense of urgency on why you do things, right? Because we, you know, often think that, ah, this will never happen, and when it does, I'll figure it out very quickly. And so you'll get an alert that says something like, oh, by the way, this, you know, service is down. We're going to try and restart it. And you're like, oh, okay, I'll just let it go. And then 10 minutes later, your boss calls and goes like, oh my god, the whole website's down. I can't get to anything. And then you're like, well, but my text or my message didn't say anything about it. And then you go debug, and then there's some you know, innocuous line like that says, service trying to restart, and that's all it says, right? Oh, see, you've had that happen. Um, <laughs> but that's where you have this type of thing happen. So that, that initial text, that initial you know, response, you know, it doesn't give the sense of urgency. And so, you know, honestly, I wish I could reprogram my daughter to say like, hey, if you need to go to the hospital, it should be like, help, take me to the hospital now, you know, or something like that, because that would send the sense of urgency as opposed to, you know, like, come on, you know, I think I might need to go, I don't know. Um, so we want to see, you know, that type of thing as we're um, designing things and building out applications. Now. The fun thing is, that's an actual example that just happened. So that was added this week. Um, you are the second crowd to see the rest of these slides. So thank you for beta testing. Um, but there are awesome good and bad practices for all kinds of design principles all throughout the world. You just have to know what to look at it. And maybe I'm just a weirdo when I look at things and go like, wow. Yeah, I designed something like this, and this is horrible. Or, wow, I should use this example in my you know, real world work. Um, so a lot of these examples um, you know, come from people who are just trying to copy other things. A lot of us copy other tech companies, but we're not comfortable copying non-tech companies. Right? How many people go to sessions and listen to Amazon or Meta or Google or Microsoft? They'll tell you how to like develop something cool, and you're like, okay, I'm gonna go try that. Right? You do that, but you never go to like McDonald's and say, I'm gonna try to do this like McDonald's does. But you could, and I'm gonna tell you why you might want to in a second. So let's talk about you know a few different things, and these are going to be rather random kind of conversations, so it's gonna you know jut around a little bit. But I want to start with talking about the responsible selection of tools and components when you're looking at building out a stack, okay? And so where do I start with that? I start with the children because they are our future. Now, how many people here have kids? No judgment if you do or don't. I don't like to admit that I do most of the time. Maybe if you don't have kids, you also can commiserate with this because kids are annoying, aren't they? There's no kids in the crowd, so I can say that. Yes, most children have times where they are awesome, but a lot of times where they just drive you absolutely nuts. And so what do we do with children who drive us nuts? Does anybody know? We distract the children, right, with TV shows and with awesome things. We try to make them see the shiny objects to let us go do whatever. Okay, this is a secret for those who don't have kids. When you do have kids, you will totally understand this. Now, um, for me, and you know, growing up, I was very different than my daughter. So I had the cool cartoons, you know, like so I got the Transformers and the Thundercats and GI Joes. Unfortunately, my daughter grew up with Teletubbies and Barneys, which was just more annoying than not. But you know, the thing with these shows is they really feed into that, you know, um, you know. Uh, kids, you know, imaginations. They really feed into what the kids are looking for. And, you know, it turns kids a little bit into lemmings, right? You know, where they're going to follow that trend, whatever their cool kids are doing, whatever the trends are happening, whatever fads are going. Now, Furby was big back in the day. It's not as big now, but, you know, there are lots of fads that come and go that become popular. Now, some of them do become iconic, right? So I can actually sit down and stomach stum SpongeBob even today. I can admit that. I have watched SpongeBob without my daughter. That does not make me a bad person, okay? Doesn't make you a bad person either. 
But when we talk about choosing tools, choosing libraries, choosing frameworks, it's a similar situation where you know, we all love cool things. Who does not love to listen to a session on new technology and something awesome that they've never heard before? And who wants to go out and try it in production? Right? I mean, I think we all do. We want to see what happens. You know, morbid curiosity, if you will. Right? Um, and so, you know, here's the fun thing about that, though, is number one, we really have short attention spans. So I don't know about you, but me, I start things and I'll start to learn things and I'll get halfway through it and then I'll be like, okay, time to go do learn something else. Right? If it didn't peak enough interest, I'm gone. Okay? The problem is a lot of people do that in the middle of projects. So they start with one framework, they start with one project, then they go to the next, right? And so you end up with this weird sprawl, this tapestry of uniqueness in an environment that is just strange, right? And what's fun about that is a lot of these, um, you know, are really hard to hire for. So if, you know, think about like the latest technologies and trends, you know, like, I don't know, maybe you're into Haskell. How many Haskell programmers out there? You know, you've got a few Haskell programmers. It's hard to find Haskell programmers, right? I'm not saying Haskell's bad. It's just, it's, it's hard to hire for when, you know, new technologies, new trends come along. But these development tools, they come, they go, and how do you handle these, right? And, you know, it's that, you know, herd mentality where we want to follow other cool people who are doing awesome things. You know, and, um, you know, not all trends, though, are going to last. And I want to tell you, it's okay to be nostalgic. Old school cool is a thing. So you can choose technologies that are tried and true and still be cool. You know, that's something that's, you know, important to realize. I give you permission. But remember, those trendy things do come and go. I'm old, so I remember, you know, everybody was all Adobe Flash. Nobody even like mocks me for that anymore. Hardware appliances, the network is the desktop. Remember the you know, Google Glasses were gonna replace all everybody's phones, right? Like all of these trends happen and they go away, right? So these are things that are happening on a regular basis. So just be mindful when you are choosing your technologies, is this going to be Barney the Dinosaur or SpongeBob, okay? Because it is a critical distinction. It really is. Now, when you do choose those components, okay? Um, we are all here at a conference that loves to celebrate open source. Most of the stuff here is open source. But my challenge to you is as we choose these components, are which version of open source are you choosing? Now, I had the fortunate or unfortunate um, circumstance where I was in Vegas for four weeks last year, or maybe it's two years ago. Um, it was like conference, conference, conference. It was just pre-COVID, so it was a couple years ago. And so it was like after four weeks of Vegas, your brain starts to do weird things, okay? I don't know if anybody has had their Vegas brain just do weird things, but of course, when we talk about open source, um, I you know, was thinking about this um, as I was wandering the Vegas Strip and as I was um, trying to find some place to eat. And of course, what is Vegas known for? The buffets, right? So many buffets, so little time. And after four weeks, you don't want any more buffets. Like, you're just, please, no, I don't want any more. But, you know, you have so many different choices of buffets that are out there, right? You know, you can get the free all you can eat when you go to certain hotels. Other ones, you get the free continental breakfast, but if you want the eggs, then you gotta pay extra. The other one is, you know, you have the free, you know, with the minimum drink purchase, or buy three buffets, get one free, you could pay per pound. There's all kinds of different ways that these buffets advertise, but all the buffets eventually do have a cost. And why this struck me as so weird is this is very similar to the open source um, you know, ecosystem right now, right? So you've got like you know, the pure open source licenses like Apache or MIT, and it's the free all you can eat buffets that you can go and you can consume as much as you want and do whatever you want. But then you've got open core, which is that continental breakfast, but you pay for the hot bar. Right, um, and then SSPL, which is you're open with restrictions. So when you have a company like Mongo or Elastic, where it's like, you know, hey, you can use our stuff for free if you pay for something over here or you follow these specific restrictions. Exit the gift store on the exit, right? Or exit through the gift store. Um, you know, the source available license, which allows you to look at the buffet before you purchase, 
or the eventually open buffet, which is you buy three buffets and then you will eventually get one for free, or the freemium SaaS cloud, which is you pay per pound. So that's the cloud model, right? So you pay per pound of food, you pay per instance, you pay per instance hour. And then of course the open source compatible, which is saying, hey, you know that buffet across the street, we're just as good as them, but you should pay us. Right, so they are all over there and we have so many choices, okay? More choices than ever. And just like there are some weird fusion food choices out there, we have that with the buffet option of licenses as well. And you know, we have too many providers trying too many things. So um, you have to understand what sort of license you have and figure out where you're eating off of that buffet. So important to not follow all the trends, but also if you do pick on technologies and you do choose components, you should make sure you're choosing the components that are fitting to your buffet lifestyle. Okay, now, now that we've picked some components and we're talking about building an application, we're talking about building something. Let's talk about success criteria. Now, how many people before they've designed anything think success? What, what does success look like? Or what's my requirements? Or what's the outcome look like, right? Some people do, some people don't, right? But how about when you build a house? What do you expect when you build a house? Okay, you probably have some expectations, right? That's reasonable, right? That it doesn't fall down, that you can live in it, that you can get electricity, that you can, you know, use the plumbing, whatever. And so this is a house that I had purchased um, a few years back. And brand new house, uh, builder spec, beautiful home, had all of the appropriate number of fixtures and everything else. And so we moved in, and when we moved in, everything was perfect for the first couple of years. About two years in, we started to notice in the bathroom one of the floors started to buckle a little bit. And we're like, oh, that's weird. So we called up a plumber and the plumber said, oh, by the way, your bathroom has a leak underneath the floor because they forgot to put an O-ring on the toilet. Okay, so it worked and it worked okay for two years, but in the end, it didn't work, right? Because let's be honest, when we say ship it, it works, it's not a good thing. Right, so yes, the toilet flushed, yes, the plumbing worked, but it's not enough to just say that it works. And that's where there is a completely fine line when we think about success criteria, right? Where is that success? What does it look like? What are we looking for? And it works is never something anyone strives for. It's something we all compromise to. Right? I mean, how many times have you been, you know, working late night, annoyed on some, you know, bug or something, and finally it just compiles, and you're like, done, and I'm going to go to bed, or I'm going to go out, and I'm going to do whatever. And it works is great, but you want it to be at least it works, and it's good enough to be sustainable. Right? That's an important distinction. You want it to not fall apart within a year or two. You want it to not just be that you know, ugly mess of an issue that's sitting underneath the floorboards, getting all gross and ready for someone to come and rip it all out and start over again, okay? And even if you are focused on good enough, okay, I want, I want to leave you with this thought here on this point, which is, you know, while an idea can, can inspire you, a good enough project generally isn't going to be something that's going to lead to commercially viable success either. So if this is part of somebody else's infrastructure, maybe good enough is okay. But if you're building your own product, you're, th this is your lifeblood of your revenue stream, it's something that you're going to want to make sure that it's better than good enough. Okay? The internet is littered with projects that are good enough. If you go to GitHub, there's a lot of projects out there. Do you know how many projects actually make money and people are like, you know, woo, I'm rolling in the dough. Not many. So. Uh, keep that in mind as well. Now, that we've decided on buildings and foundations, we've decided on success criteria, what comes next? Well, there's a lot of different components, but I like to talk about concurrency and scale. Ah, uh, yes, concurrency and scale. So, when you are building a system that can handle millions of users, or billions of users, who should you look to for an example? You might say Amazon, you might say Meta. I'm going to tell you to look at the fast food industry. Yes, because guess what? McDonald's does serve billions and billions, but I'm going to talk to you specifically about Chick-fil-A. Now, how many people here have been to Chick-fil-A? Oh, come on. We all know that you love Chick-fil-A. So I, I gave this in Amsterdam, and no one, I was like, what's Chick-fil-A? You know, like, you don't know what Chick-fil-A is? Oh, my gosh. 
So think about Chick-fil-A. Let's start with how they design their menus. They are simple, uncomplicated, right? They have chicken. You can't order a burger. You can't order a hot dog. You can't order pizza. You can't order, you know, like a multitude of things. They have a few common components, and they make those components reusable across all of their different items. And so that means that they can get an efficiency of scale. So in the back, they know how to make a chicken sandwich. They know how to put the chicken chunks in the box, right? There's not that many components, so they have optimized for that. But where their truly unique genius comes into play is in the drive-thru, okay? Now, how many people have been to the Chick-fil-A drive-thru? Okay. How many people have seen the Chick-fil-A drive-thru like this? Yes. Oh, so you don't go, right? Because most people will turn around. In fact, some Chick-fil-A drive-thrus look like this, right? Because they are popular. Now, here's the fun thing. Most people look at a drive-thru like this and they're like, nope, nope, I'm going somewhere else. I'm going to McDonald's. But Chick-fil-A has this weird thing. They have designed their queuing system, their drive-thru system, to solve scale problems. So if you see a line like that, you're going to get out in 10 minutes or less. And that's weird because it doesn't matter how long that line is. I can get in the back of the line and go like, oh, I'm going to wait forever. It's going to be 10 minutes or less. And they have this really, you know, unconventional practice where they'll send out workers into the lines and they'll take your order and then they'll run your orders out to your car before you even get to the drive through window, before you get to the order taking spot, right? So they're trying to optimize the entire process. In fact, excuse my, you know, three-year-old drawing. This is my, like, you know, three-year-old self trying to draw what a Chick-fil-A, you know, drive-through looks like. But they, they, they do multiple lanes. They have, like, a fast lane for call-ahead orders. They have mobile, you know, order takers where they'll run out. And then you could park over here, and then you can have them run out your food. So, I mean, they have optimized this process, you know, for those long queues to be able to scale. And in fact, this has been so successful, I don't know if anybody saw this, but the governments, city governments, state governments, started to ask Chick-fil-A to come optimize their COVID testing lines, right? I don't know if anybody had to do those mobile COVID testing where you're just like in the line for like 12 hours. They're like, oh my God, this is a mess. You know who we need to call? Chick-fil-A, that's right, Chick-fil-A, because they know what to do, okay? But when we look at this example, they tell us a lot about things we should do. Whoa, that is just weird. Woohoo! Look at that thing go fast. See, I'm okay. Yes, poltergeist in the system. So, what can we learn from? What can we learn from this? Right. So, we can learn a lot from the system, on the system side. Things like, hey, we should pre-validate our requests. Right. So they're running out and they're you know, ordering from the lines ahead of time, before you actually get to the place where you're supposed to order. They're pre-fetching your food and running it out to you, okay? Just like we should be pre-validating our data needs or what we need, we should be doing as much as possible, okay? They speed the delivery of data, right? We need to do that. Segregate different types of requests when we're building the application, right? Don't have everything go through a single channel. You know, if you need something that is immediately you know, time, you know, uh, bound, have a queue for that. Have another queue for something else that's slower. Have direct access if you need it so you can bypass some of the overhead, okay? Know when things are slow, you can always make changes. So have the flexibility to make those changes because the thing about that queue with Chick-fil-A, they shut down lanes when they're not busy. They don't send workers out. So they know as soon as you reach a certain level, they span up, they shrink down. And it sounds a little like some of our, you know, architectures now, right? You know, when we're talking about the cloud native space. So you can learn a lot by looking at how some of the real world examples like Chick-fil-A build their systems. Because there is a mirror on how we should be building systems to handle the same sort of traffic and workflow. But we all know that even if we're building it, you know, we're all moving faster than we ever wanted to, but, you know, I mean, I know like no one ever says, oh, just take another three or four weeks to get that deadline done. We're, we're good with that, right? They're always like, you know, we need it sooner rather than later. And so we have this, you know, move fast 
requirement. And that often has unintended consequences. So look at, you know, the growth of industrialism, all right? Yes, I'm working a lot of different references into this talk. Impressive, right? So when we look in the 19 or the 1800s and we look even, you know, into the uh, you know, the, the the last century, you know, the amount of progress across the world has been insane. And it's all been driven by industry, it's been, you know, driven by factories, it's been driven by new innovations. But one of the consequences that happened and it really came to light in the 1970s, especially here in this US, was the pollution that a lot of this was causing, right? So we had rampant pollution. Now, anybody here from Cleveland? Anybody here ever go through Cleveland? Okay, you know, have you ever heard the term the mistake by the lake? Okay, well, they used to call Cleveland the mistake by the lake. The Cuyahoga River in the 1960s and 70s looked something like this, okay? So, um, you know, this is one of the, 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 the crazy things, like, you know, ooh, we got a beach over here, you know, and uh, yeah, I don't want to go swimming in that. So what happened with this is they've had so much industrial work. All those are factories down here. They call this the factory district uh, along, along this, this edge. So all these factories dumped all their pollution into the water. And, you know, they had a problem. And one of the problems was with fires, but it was fires on the river, right? Um, not once, but a dozen times. Okay, like I don't know about you, but when I hear a river caught a fire a dozen times, that tends to tell me that there's something seriously wrong with that. So it's that unintended consequences, right? You know, you, you really don't want the river to burn. Okay, so we, we have that, but I like to take this PSA real quick. The law of unintended consequences. Anybody working on machine learning AI stuff? Okay, a few. Yeah, please don't make Skynet, thank you very much. Okay, now, how do we go through and clean the rivers? Um, so, there was not only pollution and garbage in the rivers, um, there was also a whole bunch of invasive plants that started to, you know, show up. And so, a lot of enterprising or um, really smart scientists came along with this idea. Um, you know, we should use something natural to clean up the waterways as opposed to trying to do something that could make things worse. So, you know what's really good at getting rid of garbage in the yard? Goats, right? They eat everything, yes. So, we know that goats could be lawnmowers and they can also be, you know, effective garbage cleaners. So, hmm, how do we do this for the water? Anybody have a guess? It's carp. It's carp, enter the carps, yes, yes. So in the 70s, they introduced carp to help clean up the pollution, eat the pollution, eat the garbage, eat the plants, eat all kinds of other things. But, you know, these really smart people didn't actually see one potential big problem. That is, carps like to eat. And they don't stop eating, and they're not limited to eating the stuff that you want them to eat. They will eat everything. And so we actually have a pretty bad issue right now where we've had invasive carp that are killing off all of the native fish. They're destroying the ecosystems. And it is a horrible, horrible problem. Actually, some people say it's worse than the pollution problem. Okay? And so how do you deal with this? That, 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 that's a question we haven't solved yet. But this is really an interesting case study in you know, thinking about tech debt and tech regret. Right? Because we often have solutions out here that we're like, okay, we need to solve this problem. This is a problem that is real. How do we fix it? And so we go out there and we find the new widget, we find the new software, we find the new library, we find some new way of doing things, and we decide, ah, we're gonna introduce this. Without thinking, could this make our systems measurably worse, right? And so we'll introduce that into the ecosystem, and a lot of times, it just doesn't work right. It causes more problems. And there is, you know, a, a, a process you should go through before trying to solve these problems. It's think about what these, you know, uh, new solutions, what you're going to try and do, what's the outcome going to be? What are those potential unintended consequences? And what you're introducing, if you're doing another integration, you're introducing some new technology, some new thing, you know, has it been vetted? Who else is using it? You know, um, it won't always work for you. How do you control this? And 
there is a difference between tech regret and debt. Okay, now, anybody here understand the difference? I can explain. Oh, I'll just explain. So, tech debt is something that is, you know, you know isn't gonna scale and is broken. Tech regret is where I just feel that I can do better and like I'm disappointed in the work that I have done. Okay, so there is a, a difference between the two. Um, you know, and tech regret is that process of thinking like, you know, ooh, I wrote that code when I was, you know, ten, 10 years ago, and my God, if I knew what I knew today, I would write it differently. And you know what? I'm going to redo it. It's not always a good thing because sometimes you can't, you know, capture that magic again. Like, I love movies, okay? I do. I don't know if anybody else loves movies. I love movies. But you know what? Eh, sequels to most movies aren't that great. I don't know. Teen Wolf 2, anybody? No. Jaws 3D, no. You know, just not great. But there are some ones that are better. And so the question is, if you are looking to revise or fix things, is it because you are regretting what you built and you think you could do it better? Or is it because you actually have an issue you're trying to solve? Because those are two very distinctly different things. I mean, I'm tempted to redo a lot of stuff that I do. That doesn't necessarily mean I should do it, especially if it's working and meeting the customer's and the user's needs, okay? Um, how many people have ever gone back and then rewrote something completely because you just weren't happy with it? Okay, a few people. Okay, how many uh, you know times have you done that where someone who's using the product doesn't even notice, or if they, you know they're not getting any new features, right? You know, it's like yeah, they have no idea what changed, but I spent a year and it is way better. It's good use of my time, right? Um, so will it enable the users to have some benefit? You know, um, is this going to be worth it? Those are questions you have to ask. And it's, you know, similar to back when you have the pollution side of things. You know, that's a tech debt that you need to solve. Okay, so that needs to be resolved. But when you talk about regret, that's saying like, oh, I wish I would have done something different to fix it because, yeah, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's a... Uh, a bigger deal. Now, the CARP, on the other hand, that's also tech debt and regret together. So there you go. I regret what I did. Now I really need to fix it. So how many people have bought into this new concept called DevOps? Oh, yes, the DevOps. Ah, yes. So let's talk about the best DevOps example that there is, the Cold War. Yes. This is the epitome of awesomeness for DevOps and automation. Of course it is. And I'm going to talk to you about that dark time of you know, our lives when we all lived under the fear of nuclear annihilation. Ha ha, yes, that wonderful time when Strategic Air Command was all the rage. Now, if no one is familiar with what Strategic Air Command is, let me give you a rundown. Strategic Air Command um, had the responsibility of being able to blow up anybody within 15 minutes. That's their job, right? So, you know, they decided that they were going to have lots of different locations and they were going to be able to get anywhere within 15 minutes. They had to have tens of thousands of employees distributed all over these bases and they had to be responsible for the most lethal killing thing in the entire world. Okay, so they had a pretty big job. But the problem with Strategic Air Command was, initially when they launched it, they started to do these very routine tests and they found like, oh, they got proficient on everything because their test was something like, take off and land. That seems like a good thing, you know, like taking off and landing. But then they really didn't test anything else. So they found out, like when they started to increase the tests and what they were looking for, that they were good within a five mile radius when they were gonna drop a bomb. So somewhere within five miles, you know, they could hit, which is probably not as accurate as you want it to be. Um, but they also found that they couldn't get anywhere in the world in 15 minutes. It would actually take them about three weeks. Kind of defeats the purpose of the whole thing. So they, they brought in Charles Lindbergh, of all people, um, to sit down and evaluate, you know, uh, sack and said, you know, what's wrong? And, you know, he came up with these four issues, right? Uh, inflated scores on exercises. So as they did those tests, 
they were getting like all these great reviews and they were completely controlled tests that had no real world applicability. Right? They never tested what happens if an engine stops running? What happens if like the plane won't take off? What happens if, you know, like you are missing crew members? You know, so all kinds of different things never occurred to them. They also didn't have any sort of accuracy, like I said. They also had this insanely high accident rate. Right? So people were dying within like, you know, just test flights and stuff. Um, and things were falling apart because no one actually maintained the systems and no one actually maintained the planes. They would just take them out for their test runs and if they flew, then wonderful. And they also had almost no routine and preventative maintenance. All right, so they had some pretty significant issues. So they brought in um, this new general to take ownership of this. And he really started with this philosophy of, you know, first, consistency, standardization, and leadership from the top, right? So we want to work as a team. We want everything to work together. So leaders and crew are all part of the same, um, you know, uh, group, and they should be treated the same. No one should be treated differently. But we're going to have checklists. So when we talk about those failure rates, we're going to have 600, you know, different checks. Now, how many people have gone to the airlines and, you know, you've flown recently, maybe you flew here, and you see the pilot and he's got the clipboard? These are checks that they started back here, okay? This is how, like, you know, flight started to, like, get standardized. So they check everything to make sure it works. And they also introduced different tests, a little bit of chaos engineering, if you will, into the, the system where it's like, you know, hey, it's 2 a.m., everybody get up and get on your plane and take off, right? So we were looking at ways to see what you could do to increase, you know, that consistency and efficiency. But they also built everything for repeatable scale. So knowing that they would have to potentially fight in a war, they started to make everything universal. So it was like, oh, we want every missile silo <laughs> to be the exact same. Because if the power goes out, then people know how to get around. Because they won't have the lights. And if you know, there's smoke in this, then they know how to get around. And if they know where the parts are, they can go get the parts. They know where the generator is. So every missile silo that they built was the exact same had the same process. And everyone was able to train on anyone else's job so they could fail over people in the case of an issue. Now, when we look at this and we look at the parallels in the you know, current market space, right? I mean, how, how, do you, how do you draw a Cold War back into the you know, current you know, infrastructure space? You know, we, we talk about automation, we talk about process, we talk about checklists, okay? But we still know that these still have failures, but we have built the systems to go through and check our tests. How, you know, we're, we're doing, you know, a lot of test-driven development. We're doing, you know, automated testing. You know, so we're looking for those problems that occur. We're doing our own 600-point checklists, but we're doing it automatically. We're also reusing a lot of our components. As we start to use microservices, we're trying to copy the same infrastructure so we can have that consistency. So when there is an issue, we know how to fix it. When there is a new release, we know that it is rolled out to everybody else. We also verify that every one of these things is following the process. So we focus on that verification and we hold you know, you know, each other accountable that way. But, I mean, there are some things that we don't do, right? So one of the big things that we've seen rise in the last few years is, like, chaos testing. And that's something that we haven't done enough, you know, oh, crap testing, right? Like, this is not something that's, that's good, you know? But we do see that people do take, you know, those types of tests seriously when they do do them. So these are the types of things that we can learn from, you know, this particular space. Now, a few final thoughts. Look. We're all designing new systems. We're all looking for inspiration from everybody else. You know, it's great to come to a conference here and listen to how other people are talking and doing things. But hey, as you're driving through the drive-thru, as you're going to get your coffee at Starbucks, as you're looking at that river that's on fire, you can gain inspiration from those and you can figure out new ways to potentially do some uh, really cool things. There are tons of great examples out there. And one of the great things about these is a lot of times, I don't know if you get this, but you know, you talk to somebody who's not in the tech space and they're like, oh, you work in tech. You know, can you explain to me what you do? And you're like, no. 
Um, you know, so you can take these lessons and apply them and talk to people who might not be as technical and show them like, oh, you know how this thing happened? Yeah, that's what we're trying to solve. You know, we're trying to prevent the river from catching on fire and not releasing the carp. <laughs> um, but it is something that you need to be mindful of. And so think about these types of things and, you know, hopefully you found it interesting. So we can learn from all those examples all around. So that's my talk for today, everybody. I hope that you appreciated this fun ride through history and complete nonsense. Okay, so the, the question is, uh, should automated testing be augmented with manual testing? I do think that once in a while you should go through some manual tests, yes, because I think that we rely too much on automation to save us and it often overlooks some minimal things. So I'm not saying you have to manually test every week, you know, every quarter, you know, every, you know, so often, you know, you have to do something, right? You know, like for instance, testing backups, you know, I'm a, I'm a database guy, right? So we often, just script the backups to run, but we never test them. And so you don't necessarily understand what you're seeing there. So going through that process of, you know, testing things manually as well as the automation, it, it's a good practice to go through a couple times a year maybe, or maybe even more often than that. It just depends on what your application is and how big it is, right? I don't think you could do it at mass scale, but there's so much that you can overlook um, if you're not, you know, looking at because you're, you're, you're focused just on the test you've written and if you haven't written tests for it and it's causing an issue then how do you catch it right you wait until somebody catches it in production so yeah any other questions cool all right thank you very much I hope you enjoyed this you are beta crowd number two on this talk so hopefully you liked it <laughs>